This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Well, if you would turn your attention with me today to the 18th chapter of the book of Jeremiah, the Old Testament. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 1 through 8 in the New Living Translation. Notice there these words. The Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. He said, go down to the potter's shop and I will speak to you there. So I did as he told me and found the potter working at his wheel. But the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped. So he crushed it into a lump of clay again and started over. Then the Lord gave this message, O oh Israel, can I not do to you as this potter has done to his clay? As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. If I announce that a certain nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, but then that nation renounces its evil ways, I will not destroy it as I had planned. And I'm speaking today from the subject, ordered chaos, ordered chaos. Now I know that that whole expression itself might sound a bit oxymoronish, ordered chaos. But I want you to notice that God spoke to Jeremiah, this wonderful prophet, uh, and told him, I want you to go down to the potter's shop, to the potter's house. There are some things that God cannot speak to you until you get in the atmosphere, so that once you get in that atmosphere and when he then speaks to you, you'll understand the context of what he has to say to you. And so there are some times that we're asking God to speak to us, but we've not gotten to the place yet to where if he did speak to us, that we would understand what he's saying. And so that's why he can't always answer you when you want him to answer, because you're not at the place that you need to be to have context to what he's going to say to you. And he's saying to them that the potter was at, a, at, 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 at his wheel and he was making a vessel and it messed up. It became marred in his hands. It was messed up and he squatted it and made it into another vessel. And this is what I would call ordered chaos. Sometimes when God wants to get your attention, he will order chaos and then order that chaos. In other words, he'll bring it, he'll bring order to it. He'll bring order to it. He will order chaos and then he will order the chaos. He brings order to that thing that happens in our life. Because here is the process of God. There is destruction before there is construction. I mean, before we built this cathedral here, when I first came to this property, it was nothing but trees and rocks. We had to spend $2 million blasting rock out of the foundation and cutting down trees. Just destroying stuff before we could actually construct things. That's the way it is in our lives oftentimes that God has to strip things down, tear it down before he can then actually build it to his glory. If you'll notice in Genesis chapter 1, back in the very beginning, Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 through 3, notice what the word of the Lord says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. When something is without form and it is void, we call that chaotic. It was chaotic, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. God's just hovering over all of this chaos. And then notice, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God ordered the chaos. He brought order out of chaos, ordered chaos. Our lives are chaotic without God. And when God speaks, then he brings order to our chaos that is in our world. 
I mean, wherever we are right now, what, whatever we are experiencing amid a pandemic globally, and maybe there is, is some order that God wants to bring out of chaotic things, things that are chaotic from a political standpoint, things that are chaotic from a health standpoint, things that are chaotic from a financial standpoint, things that are chaotic from a social justice standpoint. Maybe, just maybe, because he is God, that he possesses still the power to order the chaos that is in our world. I, I'm just naive enough to believe and to trust that the God who created the earth is able to recreate it, that he's able to heal, that he will wound and then he will heal, that he will tear down and then he will build up, that he'll allow us to experience darkness and things without form and, and that are void, things that are chaotic, and then God speaks and says, let there be light. I want you to see what I'm doing. When he turns the light on, something about the, the chaos that begins to scatter. Uh, let me give you a picture of what I'm talking about. Have you ever seen uh, some of those artists that work and they start taking uh, paint and just randomly splashing it on a canvas and taking something. They can take an odd object and, and they're painting something. You can't make heads and tails out of what it is that they're painting. And then they're taking all of these different colors and, and, and they're doing all kinds of things. And, and you're wondering what in the world are they doing? And then they will finish the painting and flip it upside down. And now all of a sudden you see the image clearly. That is exactly what God does with our life sometimes. He's taking various elements and the canvas of our life of who we are and splashing different things on it and he's making things and you're wondering, God, what on earth are you doing? Why did you let this person walk out of my life? Why did you let this fail in my life? Why did you let this jack up on me, God? Why? What are you doing? And it is not until God turns your life, as it were, upside down that now in retrospect you look back and you can now see clearly what God was doing. Anybody understand what I'm talking about when he's allowed your life to go topsy-turvy and it's like, God, I thank you for letting trouble come my way because I thought that this person was for me, but they were not. And you let trouble expose because whenever God turns on the fire, that's when the snakes start rising up. And there's sometimes that you don't even realize who was not for you until trouble rises, until the heat is on. When people get in hot water, that's when they then start showing their true colors. And so there are certain things that God has been throwing on the canvas of your imagination that you don't even understand until he then flips it upside down. That's the way that God does. He brings order to what looked like it was chaotic. Just because you don't understand it does not mean that God is not in it. And, and let me just tell you this, let me remind you of this. You have to be willing to walk with God, even with unanswered questions. Do you think that just because I'm saved and I'm called of God, that I understand everything that God is doing? Absolutely not. If I understood everything, if I knew everything, I wouldn't need faith. For we walk by faith and not by sight. I've got to trust him. I've got to be comfortable to say, Lord, I'm okay with walking with you with unanswered questions. Every bit of faith has to deal with unanswered questions. Why did you take mama? Why did you take dad? I don't know why, but I trust you. Remember Job after he lost everything that he had. He didn't understand he had unanswered questions. He's like, I was doing everything right that I knew to do. The Bible says that Job was an upright man who eschewed evil. And he walked up right. And then he still lost everything. And he had to walk with God with unanswered questions. God turned his life upside down. And at the end, God blessed him and gave him twice as much as he had before. He couldn't make sense out of it until his life came to the end and God flipped it. He flipped the switch. I'm just telling you, God is setting you up for a divine plot twist. Well, he will turn this thing. Plot twist. I hate going to see things when I can figure out the plot and know exactly how it's in. I'm most intrigued when I'm on the edge of my seat to say, I wonder, I mean, who did this? How's this going to turn out? I want to have some intrigue. I want to know what's going to happen. I want to be led in this thing to where God flips it and then it's like, oh, so that's who did it. So that's how it turned out. I want to be intrigued by it and God would never bore us 
by giving you a life where you can figure out everything and know who is the enemy. He wants to keep intrigue in your life. So God knows exactly what he's doing and he's taking things and he's ordering chaos and bringing beauty out of something that has been chaotic. Life moves in cycles. Life progresses in cycles. It moves. And so you go from chaos to order to then chaos and then better order. Life moves in cycles. He, he, he'll, he'll take you from being messed up. But you know when a child is born in the, in the chaos of the darkness of a watery womb, it's chaos. And then he brings them to order. And then chaos again. And then better order. Your life moves at different stages. And let me just tell you this. When you walk with God, hear me carefully. When you walk with God, your life doesn't just reach plateaus. You reach resting places. God will bring you to a place as he's developed you and now you're on a resting place getting ready for the next level that God is bringing you into. You know, after you climb a mountain, you need to rest. And you can mistake it for a plateau. A plateau is a place of complacency. God doesn't, he doesn't deal in plateaus, but God brings us after he's developed you through something, he'll bring you into a resting place. It's what God does once you've climbed up something, it's chaotic, you're tired, you're exhausted, you've got to get your breath back, you've got to get your vision back, you've got to be re-inspired. That's what rest does. Rest restores. You go from chaos to order to chaos again and then to greater order. It happens in all of the phases of life. If you've ever moved from one house to another, you move from an ordered house, and then you pack everything up, you take everything down, you dismantle everything, chaos. Then you move it to a new house, set everything up, come into order, greater order. It's amazing. Life moves from chaos to order, and when it gets ready to take you to a higher level, you always go through chaos again. Chaos. If he's going to take a visionary, he lets that visionary sleep be interrupted. Something gets disturbed. I meant when, when you really have a vision, a vision, vision, when, when vision really arrests you. A vision is not what you see in your sleep. Listen to me carefully. A vision is that that keeps sleep from you. When you really have a vision from God, you can't rest because that thing is it's talking to you at 2.38 2 in the morning. You'll be at 3.15 and your vision is waking you up in the morning and say, hey, 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 wait, wait, wake up, get, get up. Let's think about me. Get up and write some ideas. I'm not going to let you go back to sleep until you jot some things down. Let's have a board meeting about what I put in your spirit. Anybody know what I'm talking about? When you walk with God and, and you're carrying something. I, I love to see the beauty of how chaos works with a writer. When a writer is writing, whether you're writing a book, whether you're writing a play, whether you're writing a television series or writing a movie, uh, you, you go through chaotic ideas and all of these thoughts are just coming to your mind and you're wondering, my, my God, I've got this and I've got that, I've got that, and chaos, and all of a sudden God takes the chaos and order all of a sudden emerges. Now you begin to see it. it. It emerges out of chaotic thoughts, disjunct thoughts and ideas. And you'll have a little thing here for a scene here and a scene here and a scene here. A business plan. It starts with chaotic thoughts and then it all comes together. Order out of the chaos. Maybe God orders chaos in your life and then he orders the chaos. He makes the chaos make sense. So when your life is experiencing chaos, that's not the time to start cursing God. It is the time to gather perspective because God is going to flip the script so you can see what he's been designing. You'll see what he's been making in the darkness. I hope that that makes sense to you that the chaos that you're in right now is not permanent. Please understand this principle. God never ends on a negative. All is well in the end, and if all is not well, it's not the end. All is well in the end, and if all is not well, it's not the end. It's not the end. Life is full of paradoxes. It is full of paradoxes. Light is born out of darkness. Life comes out of death. Failure is the womb of success. 
joy erupts out of sorrow. Patience surfaces out of long suffering. Courage manifests amid fear. Certainty arises out of doubt. A pro evolves out of an amateur. And order emerges out of chaos. These are some of the paradoxes of life. But when you're going through chaos, chaos is depressing. Chaos saps your energy. And that's why if you're in a chaotic situation, if you're in a chaotic period, hold your hope. Just hold on because you need hope. You need hope in somebody that is outside of your situation. If you're ever in a bad fix, you need hope in somebody that is outside of your situation. And I don't know where in psychology or wherever they get the, this convoluted idea when they say that you are enough. Let me just say to you, you are not enough. That is an idea of secular humanism that makes man a God in and of himself. You are not enough. I'm not enough. I need God. I don't know about you, but I need him. I need his thoughts. I need his breath. I need his health. I need his inspiration. I need God's guidance. I need his deliverance. I need him. You are deceiving yourself when you think that you are enough. There are some whammies that life can bring to you where you fall to pieces and you are helpless. You are not enough. I'm not enough. We need God. We are not designed to be independent of God. That's why you have to have a hope that is outside of yourself that has power to inspire you and to pull you out of the deprivation of where you are. You need something outside of yourself. And people tell themselves the comforting little lie, I'm enough, I'm enough, while you cry yourself to sleep sucking your thumb. You are not enough. You need God. Hope. Hope in God. How do I know that? Just, just look, these are not my opinions. Look at the word of the Lord in Psalm 42 and verse 11. Notice this. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? Notice what he says. This is David saying, I will put my hope in God. If you're ever in a chaotic, depressed situation, put your hope in God. You will get down sometimes. Put your hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. You've got to have something outside of yourself. Don't become your own God. Don't become your own God. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in in God. I will put my hope in God. I'll put my hope in God. You know, the old folks used to say, well, baby, you know, you'll understand it better by and by. Because life will bring some things when you're in that chaos and you don't understand. And sometimes old folks, they want to comfort you and they say, but baby, just hold on, honey, because you're going to understand it better by and by. You won't always understand things at the moment. And, and as I said, you've got to be willing to walk with God with unanswered questions. And well, Lord, I don't know, but I trust in you. You have to say like Job, I've been walking upright, God, and I still lost everything that I've got. Job said, though he slow me, slay me, yet will I trust him. I'm going to trust you, God, even though I don't understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. I don't understand where I went wrong and what I did to, to mess this up. But God, I trust you. I trust you. Naked came I into the world and naked am I, I, I going to go out. But he said, blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm going to praise you anyhow. And let me just tell you, whenever your soul is disquieted, whenever you're sad, whenever you're dealing with depression, whenever you're down in your life, listen, hope in God. Hope in God and make a resolve that you're going to praise him even while you feel down. Because even when you feel down, God is still worthy to be praised. He's still worthy to be praised. And I want you to realize this. God has a plan even when you don't see it nor understand it. God has a plan, even when you don't see it, nor when you, un, uh, you have no understanding of it. So hope in God because hope has a pulling power. Hope has an inspiring power. Hope has uh, a, 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 a lifting power in your life. And may I remind you of this truth? God's plans are better than your dreams. God's plans are better than your dreams. God's plans are better than your dream. And so whenever you're depressed, put your hope in God and then release praise from your mouth. Hope in God and then release praise from your mouth because 
Praise is a sign that I got it. I've got it. Jesus said, if you believe that you receive it, then you can have it. Well, if I believe that I receive it, I'm going to start thanking God for it. I'm going to start praising God, even though I don't see anything in the natural that has changed. But in my spirit, you gotta, I've got to have the revelation of that in my spirit. Because I, I just want you to realize that there is something that is in the chaos. There's something that is in the darkness that God will actually use over time to illuminate your life. When you have a problem, God doesn't let you out of that problem until you get in the problem what God put in the problem for you, then you can get out. You don't graduate out of the problem until you get what God hid in the problem, hid in the chaos for you. Once you get it, then you can get out. Because I want you to understand this principle, that the lesson is in the struggle, not in the victory. The lesson is in the struggle, not in the victory. Your failures will teach you much more than your successes ever will. You see, the joy and the celebration are in the victory, but the lesson is in the struggle. And amid a dark and chaotic world, God said something, let there be light. God said something. What came out of God's mouth began to bring order to the chaos that was there. And could it be said that perhaps uh, out of our chaos that something needs to be said to help bring us out? He simply said, let there be light. Let there be light. And God began to bring order to the chaos. Could our way out of confusion could our way out of chaos be as simple as something that is said? Because I want you to understand this principle very clearly. Nothing is done in the kingdom of God until something is said. Nothing is done in the kingdom of God until something is said. And that's why a thing decreed shall be established. It must be established. He said, I will do nothing. Amos chapter 3 verse 6. He will do nothing except he reveal his secrets to his servants, the prophet. His, the prophet has to prophesy. They have to declare it. They have to say it to bring order to the chaos. They have to say it. They have to say it. They have to say it. But you can't just say anything. You've got to say what you see that God is saying and then speak his thoughts. And this is why we have to sometimes just get quiet in the presence of God to say, Lord, quiet my own thoughts, quiet my anxiety, God, so that I can hear your voice. And then God will begin to talk to you and allow you to begin to see a higher plan. He'll let you begin to see what he's saying, because as he declared to us in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 8, that my thoughts are not your thoughts and neither are my ways your ways. He said, mine are far higher. And when we seek him, then God can give us a revelation and an understanding of his thoughts and his word. Maybe something needs to be said in order to end the chaos, to begin to bring order out of the confusion. Maybe if we'll just have some, uh, some conversations, you'd be surprised how conversations can be roadways into peace. It can bring order out of chaos. You'd be surprised when you assume things. It's the lowest level of knowledge that we could uh, operate on. It's through assumption. But when you have a conversation, you have the ability to actually be able to make peace and come to a place of understanding and love and endearment toward one another. Can you imagine the wars that would cease between nations and companies and races and husband and wife if they only heard certain words? Wars could cease if people only heard certain words. What kind of words? If you'd say words like, I was wrong. It was my fault. Boy, men, we have a real hard time saying that. I mean, I remember, I, I mean, I thought I was wrong one time some years ago. I think it was 1988 when, it, when back with my wife, I thought I was wrong. But then upon second inspection, I was right. <laughs> words like, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Do you know that just I'm sorry can begin to bridge healing and, and, and help to people? Uh, somebody saying, I'll do what it takes to make it right. You just make a say, I'll do whatever it takes to make it right. This is not just an apologist saying, I'm sorry. It says, I'll do what it takes to make it right. If you just say, please forgive me. Just these words, just, just some simple words, please forgive me. If you just hear these words, I'm proud of you. How many sons and daughters 
have never heard their mother or their father say to them, I'm proud of you. Just those words, and sometimes there's an enemy that breeds between a son and a father, or a son and a mother, or a daughter and her mother, or a daughter and the father, because they've never heard the, them even utter the words, I'm proud of you. What words like this, help me understand uh, how to be better. Just saying those words, help me understand how to be better. Some people don't know how to love because they come from such dysfunction. And they just have to ask the question, help me to understand how to be better. Help me understand how to be better. Just for people to hear these words, I love you. I love you. You'd be surprised, just those, just those three little words, I love you. Maybe these words could, could be healing to a person that can bring order out of chaos. Let's start over. Let's start over. Let's start over. You get up and then somebody's... Uh, you know, like they got up off the wrong side of the bed that day. They walk in and come in sideways with an attitude. They're giving you shade first thing in the morning. <laughs> you know, hey, excuse me, let's start over. Let's start over. What about these words? I need you. I need you. I mean, it's, 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 it's something humbling about expressing to a person that I need you. I need you. What about these simple words? Let's be friends. Let's be friends. One way to conquer an enemy is to make them a friend. Let's be friends. Sometimes just words can pave the way for transformation. Just words. Let me tell you this. Moses got the children of Israel out of Egypt, not with picking up a sword, but with releasing a word. Just a word. It was the word of the Lord. The Word of God got them free. God can speak a word and your healing can ensue. He can speak a word and deliverance will come. God can speak a word and all of a sudden, all of your fear will dissipate just by a word. Nothing is done in the kingdom of God until something is said. That's why when you're going through something that is troubling your soul, you've got to learn to talk about it. You know why? Here's a principle that it's hard to walk through what you won't talk through. It's hard to walk through what you won't talk through. It's hard to walk through what you won't talk through. When Maya Angelou was raped as a child, it took her word. She was silent for a few years. She didn't speak. She became mute. Couldn't speak. Because it's hard to walk through what you, what you won't talk through. I think of people like the prophet Elijah, who walked through chaos and uncertainty in his life. You think that we are in troubled times and dealing with unstable leadership? Elijah dealt with it. He, he's had to serve under an apostate king and a pagan queen, Jezebel, and a wayward nation. They were wilding out. You think that we wilding out just because we got the internet? People were wilding out before there was an internet. Trust me, they were wilding out. It's a part of human nature. Elijah had to do some things though. Elijah declared the judgment of God on a nation. Uh, he endured a drought that came. He says, at, at my word, he said, there's not going to be rain. Not even dew. He said, it's not going to come. He said, it's going to be at my word. God used something that came out of his mouth to stop. He, he had to escape uh, execution. He lived in hiding for some years. He survived a famine. Uh, he defeated the prophets of Baal. And, and he had to run from a vengeful Jezebel who was trying to take his life. And yet God told him, I want you to go in, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, he said, I want you to go and stand in the mountain, in the cleft of the mountain, and I'll pass by and let you see my glory. I'm going to come by because he was, he was worn out. The chaos of his times wore him out. And he said, God, I, I need you. I need an experience with you, God. I need you, God. I need you. I don't want government. I don't want education. I don't want medicine. I need you, God. I need a dose of God. It was Elijah's way of saying, I am not enough, God. I need you. I need something outside of me. I'm putting my hope in you. God, I need you. Show me your glory. I need you, God. Elijah was suicidal. He was burned out. He was tired. The chaos wore him out. It has that way. Chaos has a way of draining your energy. It has a way of draining your energy. And so 
Elijah, in the process of that, God took him through a process. Elijah had to experience a wind. The Bible says that God came by in this wind. He sent a wind. He says, but God was not in the wind. And after the wind, he sent an earthquake. And see, there's a reason that he sent a wind. A wind is to blow things that are not grounded. And there are some things that God will just blow out of your life, some people that God will blow out of your life that are not healthy for you for your next level. And God will send a wind to just blow them out. Then he'll send an earthquake. The earthquake uproots things that have been foundational that were wrong. And so he'll start shaking your foundation, the very thing that you thought, because not everything that you thought was true was actually true. And so God will send an earthquake to shake those things. And then after the earthquake, the Bible says he sent a fire. You know why? Because God will shake everything that can be shaken until the, only the things that remain are those things that cannot be shaken. And then he'll send a fire on that that remains in order to sanctify it. And that's why that when you get saved, if you were able to dance before you got saved, you'll be able to dance afterwards. It's not that God takes your dance away. He sanctifies it. He puts a fire on it. It's not, I mean, if you were funny before you got saved, you'll be funny after you got saved. He just sanctifies. He puts a fire on your tongue. He sanctifies it. So God sanctifies us. He sends the fire. And so here's Elijah. He's burned out. He was suicidal. And he says, God, I can't do this. I can't do this anymore. I can't go another step. And his life was chaotic. And God says, chill out. Just get into a resting place. Get into a resting place and I'm going to pass by. And he sent the wind, but he wasn't in the wind. And he sent the earthquake, but he wasn't in the earthquake. And he sent the fire, but he wasn't in the fire. And then it says, and after the fire, a still, small voice. That's where he gave, found God. It was not in a thunder. It was not in the lightning. It was in a still, small voice. And you may wonder. Why would God speak to Elijah in a still, small voice? And the real secret to why God would speak in a whisper, he only whispers to let you know that he is close by. You would never whisper to somebody in another country, in another state, in another city, in another room. You whisper because the person is close. When God whispered to Elijah, it was his way of saying to him, I'm right here with you, and we are going to get through this together. God will bring order out of your chaos. And he will. And that's what he did in the life of Elijah. He brought order out of chaos. I want you to notice that when our minds begin to devise things that are chaotic, uh, that's where we start leaning to our own understanding and that is always a detriment. Whenever we start leaning to our own understanding, our own scruples, our own ability to figure things out, then we begin to corrupt the simplicity that is in Christ that the Bible talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. But I love something that Oswald Chambers said when he made the following observation about simplicity. He said this, the marvel of the grace of God is that he can take the strands of evil and twistedness out of a man's mind and imagination and make him simple towards God. Restoration through the redemption of Jesus Christ makes a man simple. And simplicity always shows itself in action. There is nothing simple in the human soul or in the human life. The only simple thing is the relationship of the soul to Jesus Christ. That is why the Apostle Paul said, I fear lest by any means your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And let me just say this to you. The more sophisticated that we have become as a culture, as a society, the more we have corrupted the simplicity that is in Christ. And I want you to understand that simple doesn't always mean easy. Simple doesn't mean easy. Not everything that's simple is easy. 
Easy means causing or involving little difficulty or comfort or discomfort. Uh, it's requiring or indicating little effort or thought or reflection. That's something that's easy. It's just easy. Little, little effort, little thought, little reflection. Uh, th there's little discomfort. That's easy. But simple, here's simple. Simple in the biblical sense refers to anything that is pure, unadulterated, and free from mixture of evil. When you find something, I've, I've seen things and it'll just say, uh, simple syrup and that I mean it's just this is just syrup with no bells and whistles to it this if, if you find the simple spearmint it's, it, it doesn't have any any additives to it it's just simple it's pure it's simple and there's sometimes that God doesn't want us to have mixture and things added to us he just says I want I just want the simplicity of who you are with me to know that Jesus is enough in him we are complete we can do all things through him not to say that I am enough no I'm not enough I'm enough with him I'm not enough by myself without him Edwin Teal said that reduce the complexity of life by eliminating the needless wants of life and the labors of life reduce themselves. Isn't that interesting? I want you to understand that sometimes God lets you lose some things in life to simplify your life. Just to simplify. He'll take some things away from you just to simplify you. The pandemic that has happened in America in 2020, that has happened in the world in 2020, brought people back to a simpler life. I've never seen so many happy dogs because they're animals. You know, these animals, that their, their owners were so busy going to and fro, now they've spent so much time, you know, they're poor. I feel so sorry for dogs and cats and goldfish and things when they're, you know, the folks that, that, that own them are spending so much time with them and then after it's all back and they're gone and they're going to miss that, the, the simplicity. But loss can be a divine tool used to create a desire for change. Loss can be a divine tool used to create a desire for change, which usually takes us back to the basics. And at times, God uses shaking to bring us back to our simplicity in Christ. He'll just use shaking just to bring us back to our simplicity in Christ. Socrates said to beware of the barrenness of a busy life. Beware of the barrenness of a busy life. You see, because we live in a world that is dominated by materialism, just dominated by materialism. We got too much stuff in our closets, in our attic, in our basement. Then when we run out of space, now we got all of these storage facilities and storage pods and stuff, because we got stuff everywhere. We just got stuff, barns and sheds and stuff underneath the bed. And, you know, and we get bigger and bigger barns and trying to move into bigger houses, put more stuff. And then you fill that up and then you need some more stuff. And every time you just, it's bigger and bigger. And, but if you take away all of our modern sophistication, all of our technology, all of our chic clothing, and all of our high fashion shoes, and if you take away all of our sporty and luxurious cars, and if you take away our plush homes and all of our compact gadgets, and all of our automation, and if you take away our cyber world, and our cell phones, and our computers, and our televisions, all of the basic human needs remain the same. Without all of the bells and whistles, without smart TVs, without the power of a computer in the palm of your hand, if you take away all of that, all of our human needs are basically the same. Five basic human needs here. Number one is the need to survive, air, water, food, and shelter. Number two, the need to belong. You gotta belong to some place. That's why you have to, everybody's gotta be able to find their tribe. That's why you need to be a part of a local church and get in a small group. We have a need to belong. And number, number three, we have a need to develop or to gain power. To develop or to gain power. Number, th number four, we have the need to be free. As a cry of the human soul, we have a need to be free. That's why I used to sing that before I be a slave, I be buried in my grave. There's a need to be free. Number five, the need to have fun. All work and no play. Makes Jack real dull and so does it make James dull too. We have a need to have fun. We have a need for that. And I love something that Hans Hoffman said, that the ability to simplify means to eliminate the unnecessary so that the necessary may speak. And maybe you need to think about that this week. What is it that I need to eliminate out of my life so that the necessary can speak? Maybe the necessary wants to speak. That's a part of the simplicity 
in Christ. You'll never graduate from God. And sometimes we have to lose some things before we find our simplicity in Christ. What's happened to our simplicity of Christ? We have to get back to a godly perspective. Peace does not mean that you won't have problems. It means that problems won't have you. When you have peace, peace is always based on a revelation. It doesn't mean you won't have problems. It simply means the problems won't have you. You remember when uh, in the second chapter of John, St. John, Jesus' mother said to the folks around there when they had run out of wine at the, at the wedding, Jesus did his first miracle. She says, whatever he says to you to do, do it. Whatever he says to you to do, do it. And sometimes all it takes is one simple faith action to experience God's peace. Just one simple faith action. Whatever he tells you to do, do it, and then you'll have the peace of God. Just one thing. Do that one thing that he says to you. That one thing that he tells you to do. Whatever he tells you to do. You want to see a miracle? Whatever he tells you to do. You remember in Luke chapter 10 when Mary and Martha were there and Martha, she was a doer and, uh, and Mary was a worshiper sitting at the feet of Jesus and Jesus said, she's chosen that good part. He says, Mary, uh, you know, Martha, I know, you know, he says, you're, you're mindful about too many things. He says, you are distracted, distracted by too many things. That word distracted means dragging around in circles, dragging around in circles. When you're dragging around in circles, it means that you're chaotic. It, it, it means that you, you, you're in confusion, dragging around in circles. You are distracted. You got ADD, Mary. I mean, Martha. He says, you, you're dealing, he says, you're dragging around in circles. You're not getting anywhere. You're dragging around in circles. You're frustrated because your life is at the same place, getting up with the routine, doing the same thing, and you got to get at the feet so that you can, you can go to another level. Here's, here's a principle that I want to teach you. It, it's that first, you have to download if, in order to upgrade. You cannot upgrade until you first download. It's a principle of life. You see it with our electronics. If you want to upgrade to the, to the latest level, you have to download before you can upgrade. And that's what Mary was doing. Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus downloading so she could upgrade. And, and, and here was Martha doing everything, fixing, going about. Yes, things need to be done. But instead of just working in your business, you got to work on the business. You got to work on it, not just in it. You got to work on it. You got to download something so you can upgrade. Thank God for your tuning in today. I believe that you're downloading some stuff because God's getting ready to upgrade your life. He's getting ready to bring things that have been in confusion in your life and God's going to flip the script. He's going to say plot twist. Just when he thought that the devil had you, God says, I've got something. I've got something in the last scene. You just wait until how this thing ends. God says, you're not going to know how it's going to end and when it's going to end. He says, I got a plot twist. The devil thought that he had you. He thought he messed you up with your credit with this crazy person that came into your life. Plot twist. God said, that's when you thought that you were not going to get out of this thing alive. Plot twist. God has a way of just turning things around for his glory. And I just thank him for it because this is the thing that I know is that God is a God of order. God is a God of order order. God is a God of order. And here's the truth of the matter. Our wholeness comes out of our brokenness. Wholeness comes out of brokenness. Wholeness comes out of brokenness. It emerges out of brokenness. And this is the truth of the matter. Please hear me about the Spirit of God right now. The farther that you get away from God, the deeper into chaos your life becomes. The farther that you withdraw from his presence, the more chaotic your experiences are. The farther that you get away doing what you know is right, the farther that you get away from God's presence, the more confused, the more convoluted the more dissatisfying, the more unfulfilling what you're trying to do becomes. Chaos in its ultimate understanding is withdrawal from God. When the earth was without form and void and darkness covered the face of the deep, it's because God had not stepped into the situation to say anything about it. It was devoid of God. And when you see the lives of people, sons, daughters, brothers, sisters, 
husband, wife, when you see their life drifting away from God, you see the denigration, the degradation, the deprivation that happens to their soul, to their morality, their, their cautiousness. You see the unrest and now you've got to take drugs to help you go to sleep and drugs to help you to get up and to function. Because the farther away that you are from God, the deeper into chaos that your life sinks. The chaos that is in the world is because God has not stepped in and said something. The thing that we as children of God in the midst of our chaos, whenever things are going awry in your life and you don't understand it when havoc has been wreaked and you're wondering, God, what in the world am I going to do? The question that ought to rise up out of your soul is, is there a word from God? Is there a word from God? Yes, it may look chaotic. You may not know how ends are going to be met, but there's a God who steps into the midst of that. As I said, you've got to be willing to walk with God with unanswered questions. The farther that you get away from God, the farther that you go out of his presence, the farther that you go away from his teachings of truth, the greater distance that you put between you and God, the greater the confusion, the greater the chaos. And maybe you can afford finer homes and more comfortable mattresses and comfortable lazy boy chairs, but there'll still be a discomfort in your soul. It doesn't matter what kind of car you drive, it matters what's driving you. It's really about what's happening on the inside and if you ever get away from God, chaos ensues. If you ever come into a chaotic country, a chaotic government, it's because they have withdrawn themselves from God. But when our dependence is upon God and we say, God bless us, God help us, God give us leaders after your heart. When God is present, order comes, peace comes. When the righteous rule, the people rejoice. Prosperity fills the land. Calm is in the land. But the farther that we get away from God, the further that we will go away from his precepts and concepts, the more chaotic our lives and our world will become. And today, if you're in chaos, if you're in confusion, if you're in depression, if you're in a bad position in your life, and you said, God, I, I can't keep living like this. I don't believe that I was designed to live this way. God, I need you. I need you. It's really quite liberating to reach that place where you realize I am not enough. I don't know enough. I don't have enough. I am not enough. I need you, God. I need you. And I want to invite you today that if you need Jesus to come into your life, he'll walk to you on the water in the midst of a storm. He's never intimidated by the storm. He'll walk to you in the storm. Even if your house is on fire, while others are running away from the fire, Jesus comes walking into the fire. He'll come into the fire with you. And he'll whisper to you, I'm right here. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. As you're burying your loved ones, God says, I'm right here with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. When you're dealing with craziness all around you, he's the anchor to your soul. When he's with you, he brings order out of the chaos. And maybe, just maybe, God has ordered chaos in your life to open your eyes to the great need that you have for him now to order the chaos in your life. Bring order to it. Flip the script so you can see in retrospect why you had to go through what you went through. You'll never get that perspective on your own. That doesn't come by insight, it comes by revelation. Insight comes from within, revelation comes from without. Revelation only comes from God. 
you receive the revelation that God has given. We need him. We need him. And I want you right now, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ or if you've accepted him at one time and now you've gotten out of fellowship with him, and you need to be restored to right relationship with God. You've been in such darkness and so confusion. You've you wondered, God, if you're real, I mean, why am I experiencing this? Why am I going through all of this? Why, why is all of this happening to me? God, when am I going to get out? Why, why, why am I not blessed? Why does it seem like I'm cursed? Maybe God wants to come into your chaos and order your chaos. Let you experience Him. Experience Him. Peter walked to him on the water. Jesus caught him by the hand when he was sinking. And he'll catch you by the hand and bring order to your chaos. And when, when he got him back to the boat, the, the waves and the wind ceased. God brings order to the chaos. When he opens his mouth, light comes to your darkness. And you'll be able to see what God was saying and see what he was doing. But in the meantime, you've got to be willing to trust him even with unanswered questions and walk with God to say, Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but I trust you. And I would encourage you today, put your trust in him. Put your trust in him. If you'll just pray this simple prayer with me, God will open your heart. He'll just come right in to the door that you open and sup with you and allow you to have real relationship and he will bring order to your chaos and he'll bring you peace in the midst of your storm. Because it may not be worked out immediately, but God will give you a peace in knowing you're going to come out of this. And I'm going to walk you through it. I'll walk with you along this journey. If you're out of fellowship with Jesus, just pray this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I open my heart to you. I receive you as Lord and Savior of my life. Take charge of my thoughts. Order the chaos that is in my world. Fill me with your peace, your love, your joy. Give me an experience with you that cannot be denied. And empower me to tell everyone I meet about your goodness. Enable me to do the purpose for which I'm born to do. Show me a revelation of your will for my life as you now order my chaos so that I see your hand masterfully guiding me through this process called life that I might serve you and your purpose for my good and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I trust that you've received something from God's word today. And may the peace that God brings into your heart and in your life empower you to be able to share him with others. And maybe just looking at you, if a person realizes what you've been through, and that's the power of our testimony, we overcome the devil by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony and by not loving our lives to death. When you share your testimony, you become a living witness to others that you can make it even when you've been through the fire, even when you've been burned, betrayed, deceived, molested, you can still make it. God will walk with you and he will order the chaos that's been in your life. He's a God of order and he brings order out of your chaos. So allow God to show you people in your path that you are duty bound to be able to minister and share your story with. Share your story of liberation, of God's grace, of how he's ordered your chaos and you become a beacon light of hope to someone else to show them the way out as well. Well, blessings to you. Please know that we love you. We miss you so dearly and being able to see you live and in person and we will come back to that time but I tell you, there is no stopping of the power of God, the flow. And I wish that you could feel right there what we sense right here in the sanctuary of the living God. But we look forward to the time when we'll be able to hug and shake hands one with another, encourage one another, and sing in concert to the glory of God. We are the church. 
whether we are the church gathered or the church scattered, we are still the church. It will go marching on. Know that we love you. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you next week. God bless you. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.